Welcome to Foreign Countries, Conversations in Archaeology with me, Ash Lenton. If you're enjoying Foreign Countries and you want to hear more episodes, please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button, foreigncountries.podbean.com. When the Roman Empire established new colonies, it kind of had a blueprint for doing that for establishing towns, fortifications, building roads, and instituting the law. Or did it? I'm sure it was a lot more chaotic than that, especially in the aftermath of war. And when we look at different locations, the local context, that's the people on the ground, would have had a significant, even decisive influence on the establishment and the growth of the colony. So today, I'm taking a look at two really groundbreaking research projects to examine that imperial expansion. Later on, I'll be talking to Jim Morris and Duncan Sayer of the University of Central Lancashire about the Ribchester Research Project on a cavalry fort and its urban development in Northern Britannia. But first up, I have Dr Hannah Friedman with me to talk about Rome's first serious excursion outside of Italia. Together with Dr Catherine Huntley of Boy State University, Hannah is a co-director of the Labana Urban Landscapes Project. Nana, you've been working at Labana for several years now. Let me begin by asking, why here? Why now? Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank, especially my co-director, Katie Huntley, has done a massive amount of this work. Working there for multiple years, she's been digitizing the entire Labarna bibliography, but also Dr. Simone Lerma and Luisa Papopi. And I would like to thank the superintendency of the province of Alessandria that oversees the archaeological sites in the region, including Labarna. I'd also like to thank John Bradford, our GPR specialist, who works at the Colorado Schools of Mines, as well as Mike Boyles, who was our drone specialist. The background is pretty fascinating. I've studied Roman archaeology in many other parts of the Roman Empire, but this was my first time really working specifically in Italy. And one of the things that drew me to Roman archaeology throughout the rest of the empire is the idea that despite what everyone thinks, there really isn't a set Roman pattern. That the empire, all of its colonies, all of its new places it reaches, it becomes part of the Roman Empire, but it does it in its own unique cultural way. And so what I found so fascinating about Labarna is that everyone sort of considers it part of the Roman Empire. It's sort of a part of Italy, therefore it's always been, but actually it's not. And all of the interesting things I find about the rest of the Roman Empire, Labarna actually is where Rome started thinking about this, where Rome started learning how to be an empire, to conquer places to set up colonies, what strategies it used to best economically exploit everywhere. Because we usually think of Rome and we think of the imperial period and Augustus and the great city of Rome being almost the process of becoming an empire was almost finished at that point. And then they reproduced it in many other places with cultural differences, but there are similarities. And this is a colony that was founded at the beginning of the second century BC. So it's pretty early on, it's Middle Republic. And so it's Rome's earliest start. It's not when Rome sort of had a game plan together. Instead, it's Rome, I mean, Rome is beginning to figure out what it's doing. And that I find far more interesting than some other examples that I've studied. So my work in Jordan, for example, in a Roman mining site was deep empire. Many emperors had existed before. Many emperors would exist afterwards. They kind of knew what they were doing when they got, they hit the ground running with the Roman army. They organized how they wanted to, and it was done. And this is a more in between, a more liminal time when they're still figuring out how exactly does Rome Rome, in a way. How exactly do they empire? They are, of course, still a republic during that period. So they haven't had the massive military buildup yet. They haven't had a whole bunch of things yet. So they're still learning, I think, some fundamental principles of how they're going to become this mighty empire. And that's what I find so fascinating about Labarna. Right. So it's part of modern Italy. But what do we know about it before the Roman conquest? Labarna is located in northern Italy, so it's about an hour south of Turin now, 
and it's along the Via Postumia. This is the major trade highway that goes pretty much from Genoa all the way to the coast. So from coast to coast up there, I'm running west east. And this is a major thoroughfare if you want to cross northern Italy, if you want to cross sort of below the Alpine region. And just it, it to sort of highlight how important this region is, when Napoleon went through, he camped about 15 miles away from Labarna when he was taking over the city of of Gavi. And in fact, um, from Gavi Fort, you can look and see where Napoleon camped. Uh, the Nazis set up a prison camp there. When the modern Italian government decided that they were going to build a major highway and two major railroads, they did it literally right through the center of ancient Labarna. There is a theater on one side and then the railroad track and then the road and then a bunch of fields. And so in that way, it makes sense. It's a huge highway that connects people and cultures and, and economies. And so it's incredibly important. But after the Second Punic War is when it's conquered. So it was inhabited by Gauls for this entire time and other tribal non-Romans. And so it is, in fact, a foreign country when they conquer it, but one that has had a lot of cultural contact with Rome and the Roman Republic Empire. So um, while they're familiar with each other, it is not the same thing. And so when Rome conquers it, and we sort of forget this always, but when when Rome stops being a tiny little podunk nowhere town that it starts as and becomes a land empire, it has to conquer all of Italy first. And this is one of the last places of Italy that it conquered, the north. It was Gaul on this side of the Alps. So this is their closest to them side of the Cisalpine Gaul region. Projects like this are a major undertaking. So how did you go about it? And what were you actually trying to achieve? Always archaeology is such a team effort. And I'd very much like to thank Lynn Foxhall and Allison. And I believe Lynn was still at the University of Leicester at that point, but I'll give a shout out to the University of Liverpool as well. They were instrumental. Katie Huntley, who is my co-director, and myself, we both did our PhDs at the University of Leicester. So that's how we got to know them. They collaborated with us on it, as well as the Italian government, of course. And together, we they introduced us to the idea of the region and we were enchanted by it and all of its possibilities. And so the Labarna Urban Landscapes Project in its current form is myself and Katie Huntley from Boise State University. And our major goals the first few years were to really get to grips with the area to understand it better because so much work had been done previously and over so many centuries. And um, one of the first sort of main tasks was to figure out where all this information was stored, figure out how much of this information we could believe and collate and bring together all this information instead of having disparate sort of centuries apart, different discoveries, how all these maps came together. So our first few seasons were pretty much information gathering, I think is the best way to describe them, rather than data generating. Yeah, there are some major parallels there with the Ribchester project that I'll be talking about later. So what was all this previous information that you, you needed to pull together first? Well, there's three museums in the region that contain the collections for La Barna. And the local one is Kapuro Collection. He was a, a 19th century priest, actually. So Kapuro was an antiquitarian who gathered these materials and, and formed the Kapuro Collection. And he was one of the first to do it in a systematic fashion. And then on and off, sort of through the next hundred or so years, work was done here or there. And a lot of it was in response to the Italian government saying, we want a major highway through there. So that... It was a lot of rescue archaeology work frantically in front of the highway. And then the railway line went through and it was a bunch of rescue work frantically in front of the railway. So that's sort of the main driving force behind it, either interest, local interest or desperate rescue archaeology. And so um, having research driven archaeology is much rarer. One of the individuals who sort of definitely brought all of this together was Finocchi, Silviana Finocchi, in the 70s and 80s, actually did research-driven archaeology, where she was trying to help gather together some of these earlier digs, and she excavated two large insulas, beautiful houses, mosaics, all the trappings of a good Roman city she found. And that forms sort of the central half of the archaeological park that exists now in Labarna. The rest of the city, however, is still under field. 
And so there's about three or four farmers that we're working with currently who have uh, large portions of the city sort of under grain, under corn, whatever, whatever it is they're growing this year. And so it's sort of half owned by the superintendenza and half owned by local private farmers. So I read in your site reports that you were very successful using geophysics, but you used quite a combination of techniques, didn't you? So um, when doing geophysics survey, it's usually very good to do a number of different techniques because you never quite know what you're going to find underneath the surface. And given that it was very dry and only about a couple meters down, we had a, a few options. Electrical resistivity was our first one. Unfortunately, it was so dry that didn't work very well. And that's, of course, where measuring the amount of time it takes for electrical signals to get in between the probes and the machine is how you tell if it's slowed down or not. That's how you can tell it's going through a heavy object. And of course, without a lot of water in the soil, unfortunately, that meant that it just the electrical current wasn't flowing terribly well. Also, unfortunately, those two railways that I mentioned (laughs) have overhead lines. And that really affected, yeah, it was uh, pretty impressive how badly that could affect it if we we had to hold up the machine every time a train went past. And at one point, we found out that a train traveled through the region sometimes every 13 minutes on average. Needless to say, unfortunately, electrical resistivity was not a useful tool, even though it's incredibly good in, in most other situations. The other one we used and used incredibly successfully was ground penetrating radar. And that produced amazing effects. We found entire insula with that. We could see the forum and new structures. We could find different floor types. We could see where roads were. So that was incredibly useful. And we got very clear signals of the radar going down, hitting an object, and then how fast it came up would tell you the distance, of course. We could look underneath, for example, a um, gas station pavement. We could see that underneath the pavements of both the gas station and, in fact, the Labarna archaeological park, there's still archaeology underneath it, protected by the tarmac. So that was pretty exciting as well. Our surprise was the drone. We did not expect to see so much from the drone, but actually it turned out to be by far our most useful remote sensing device. We initially planned to use it just for getting a lay of the land to form a DEM of the uh, a digital elevation model of the region to sort of see what we might be missing. We can't exactly walk along the railroad track, not good with students. So having a drone go over it during the 13 minutes when a train is not going past was very helpful for us to sort of get an entire picture of the landscape. But it turns out that 2017 and 18 were two drought years and the crop marks were spectacular to the point where we could see individual paving stones in the roads and individual column bases. We not only would get the outline of a building, but we'd get sort of the extras. We could see what a curbstone looked like. It was so clear in these crops and it was pretty much unbelievable. And what was very exciting about that is we could actually go back to all of the 18th, 19th century archaeologists, early 20th century archaeologists, and we could look at all the hand-drawn maps they had or the surveys that they had conducted, and we could actually start piecing them together without ever having broken the soil. And with that, we were able to start pulling in all these different resources until we could get a better and fuller map of the region than previously ever existed. And that was pretty amazing. Well, yeah, the results are pretty spectacular. So can you kind of paint me a picture of this mapping? Well, like most Roman cities, it is oriented along this Via Postumia, this consular road that runs through the middle of it. That's its main sort of branch. And then the town sort of grows up around it. And what's interesting about Labarna is it has no city walls, which is very rare for a town in that area. But as you're going north-south on this, as you're starting in the south, you've got a, a amphitheater. And then you've got above that one of the best examples of a Greek theater that's been ever preserved. And so whenever I talk about Labarna, I'll have any colleagues that I bring this up to, they go, oh yes, the theater. 
And that's what they know about the site. And it is a lovely theater. So that's on one side. And then on the other side is the forum, which had been lost for a very long time. Not really lost. We kind of knew where it was. But there was some question about its exact placement. And one of the really exciting things about the drone work is we were both able to confirm earlier excavations of the forum where they had found things. And then bring into question some of their work. I think they made things grander or more Romanized than they may have actually been. Some of the side buildings look a lot more peculiar and less, they don't look quite how they're drawn on the map. And so in that respect, the previous work we were able to look at and our work sort of came into conflict. We started asking questions. What is this? Who do we believe? And those are one of the areas we want to uh, investigate by actually digging to ground proof, as it were, these sort of hypothesis of what this building might be. And uh, we think it's probably got a stronger northern tribal flavor to it, culture uh, influence to it than a pure Roman, Greco-Roman building style. And now you're planning to start excavations. So what are the future research questions? So what we really want to do is both get an area which has had little excavation to see if we can get a culture profile going down. What we want to know is what items, what pottery, what objects are typical of different uh, strata and different time periods. We want to see sort of what is imported, what is locally produced, and we want to have hopefully better than just a regular dichotomy that you find on most Roman sites of Roman and not Roman, where it's far more likely to be Roman-ish and local-ish, and maybe something new in between those two things. Maybe they, they've come up with a third option, and that's what we really want to to look at. And there's so much stuff that's already in the museums, been collected from farmers and has, you know, from these salvage operations and really like to go through them again with a new eye, having this stronger contextualized information about objects and and dating and sort of try to piece that together and bring back more contextual knowledge to this great resource that's in a museum. The other thing we really want to do is question those areas we're not quite sure about. So the forum is pretty identifiable as a forum, except for the giant, and I use this again with quotation marks, Celtic temple right smack dab in the middle of it. And that we would love to excavate because that just seems sort of everyone always clears out the forum and doesn't really pay attention to anything that doesn't look super Roman. But we want to know what's not Roman. We want to know what is built by the Romans for the locals, by the locals adapting Roman. You know, there's so many different cultural conundrums that we can get into. So how are you going to address these questions of Roman or cultural or regional identity? We really want to hit up the areas that are less, I would say, less imperialized, less public spaces. We want to go for a lot of domestic regions where we can hopefully see this negotiation of cultures happen, perhaps not on the grand public scale, but privately within homes, privately within people's lives, because that's where we're going to see, I think, less copying of Roman styles almost exactly, and then more negotiation, more compromise, uh, where we can start seeing some very interesting, I think, regional differences, especially over time. When the Romans arrive, how strongly is the area Roman? Um, how, do they buy in totally to this? Are they really proving their Romanness, especially after the Second Punic War, where there's a huge problem with allied cities in the Roman Republic? They're penalized quite horribly if they're not very much for Rome. So are they trying to prove themselves? Are they outside being very Roman, but inside secretly griping about the Romans? Are they upset about having to be part of this empire, having been conquered? You know, how how are they expressing themselves at home, I think, is one of the more interesting things that we can find out. So those are three sort of areas we want to check out. What we don't know, what we think is different, and definitely their home, their home lives. Hannah Friedman there on the negotiated identities of Roman Libana. Now, keeping with that theme of negotiating identities at the frontiers of the empire, 
I'm going to turn now to the Ribchester Revisited project in the north of Britannia on the way to Hadrian's Wall. The fort of Bremet and Arkham in the modern village of Ribchester has long been thought of as the location for a Sarmatian cavalry unit. The Sarmatians having been migrated from the Persian steppes via the Rhine to the militarised zone of northern Britannia. Ribchester is another long-term and far-reaching research project, looking at the development of the fort from the first century onwards, and shows the settlement very far from that stereotypical idea of how a Roman fort should have been. I'm joined now from the University of Central Lancashire by co-directors Dr Jim Morris and Professor Duncan Sayer. Jim, if I can come to you first. This project has been a long time in the making. Can you give me some background? What drew you to Ribchester as an archaeological resource? So Ribchester has been well known as a Roman site, but actually the excavations at Ribchester have followed almost the development of archaeology in the UK. John Leyland commented about the amount of Roman remains that were present at Ribchester, famous antiquarian Stukeley as well. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, you had interested amateurs who were doing some excavations at Ribchester. Thomas May, in the early 1900s, and he was very interested in the stone fort. And then actually Ribchester really lay untouched for a while until there was a little bit of rescue excavation in the 1970s and then a large degree of rescue excavation by English Heritage in the 1980s. But Ribchester is actually famous also for being on Time Team, so it was the second site to ever be excavated by Time Team. And a lot of those excavations are piecemeal, concentrated on very small areas around the Roman fort that's there, and nothing has ever brought them together. So there's a lot of potential there, but what we didn't know was actually what happened in the later Roman period. So because of the nature of the excavations that had taken place, it was assumed that Ribchester was abandoned around 300 AD. More recent excavations at Binchester and sites upon Hadrian's Wall have revealed that actually there seems to be a continuation of settlement on the forts going into the late Roman period and possibly into that early medieval period. Okay, so how did the fort fit into that military network? So Ribchester's in the county of Lancashire. It's in a beautiful part of the world called the Ribble Valley. And the Ribble is a main river that comes down from the Pennines and basically runs through Lancashire and exits out into the Irish Sea. It's probably one of the first points in which you could cross that river going up from Manchester and then going up across the west coast of the UK up towards Hadrian's Wall. So it's very much in that northwestern zone of Roman Britain that wasn't part of the first wave of conquest. It looks like the Roman army didn't take over control of this part of the UK until AD 70s, where there's a push north. Until that point, you've got the Briganti tribe that is possibly friendly to Rome. It's an interesting location because of the routeways that are there. So you've got the main north-south road that goes from Manchester up to Carlisle. And then you've actually got an east-west road at Ribchester as well, which goes out from the fired coast that will go through Ribchester and then up and over Ilkley Moor and then finally to York. So so Ribchester is actually a main east-west and north-south crossroads. So it is in that military controlled zone of northern Britain, but it's very much at the southern edge of it. If you're thinking of Lancashire, Cumbria, Yorkshire, Hadrian's Wall, that whole part of of Roman Britain is very much dominated by military archaeology and Ribchester is just on the southern fringe of that. So it's a fantastic resource, but what questions did you set out to answer? So one of the key research questions was what is occurring at Ribchester in that late Roman period and moving into that early medieval transition and what excavations on a small number of other sites, so so in Carlisle for example, had discovered was that there seemed to be activity near granaries and near gatehouses in the later parts of the Roman period and maybe into the early medieval period. So one of the ways to investigate that at Ribchester was with new excavation in a similar area 
area. So the granaries within the later stone fort had already been found by an archaeologist known as Thomas May. And he had also identified where the northern gatehouse for the stone fort was. So using his plans, we were able to position a trench within the area of the northern entrance to the stone fort. And what's interesting about that is because Ribchest is at the southern end of this military control zone, what it adds is our ability to see if that kind of activity we're seeing on forts on Hadrian's Wall is actually occurring elsewhere. So naturally you started with the later layers, later antiquity. How did your methodology develop as you dug down into the earlier centuries? Other questions we had included looking at that transition from the wooden fort that had been found in 1989 in the English Heritage excavations and the stone fort. And, and I should say there's a number of forts at Ribchester. There is an earlier wooden fort that dates from the 70s AD. And then there's the stone fort. But actually the relationship between the two is something we're not quite sure about. And actually, that's a different methodology entirely. That's very much a methodology of synthesis and of taking the disparate records from previous excavations and starting to put them together and develop a chronology across those different excavations. But another interesting aspect is Ribchester's still there. And actually, if you look at a lot of the forts in Northern England, a lot of them don't continue into being settlements today. So, so the fact that Ribchester stayed as a settlement and continued as a settlement, it's there in the Doomsday Book, and it's got a early medieval church. So the fact that it continued as a settlement meant we were really interested in also what's occurring in the landscape and in the area around the fort as well. So there was some evidence for a vicar for an extramural settlement. There was a bath house that was discovered and excavated in the 1970s, although it's never been published and is part of our synthesis project. So the other strand of the project was landscape survey and geophysics to examine the extent of the vicus that was around the settlement and to explore how Ribchester developed from its Roman origins, from that early timber fort, and how it continued through beyond the Roman period as well. So a large part of that was we did a big geophysics survey all the way around the village with the help of Historic England, because Historic England were also very interested in our results and how it can help them protect the heritage there. If I can bring Duncan in here, what about getting at the people who lived in the fort? As Dr. Morris has already alluded to, in our uh, sort of beginnings and our methodologies. One of the things that, that was slightly problematic with the information we had available to us at the beginning was that most of the previous projects had identified the fortifications and attempt to date the fort. And what we wanted to do was sort of move our understanding into the modern archaeological era. So we were trying to excavate just inside, but include some of those fortifications so that we could tie together our results also investigate the interior of the fort. One of the things we were very interested in is trying to really get at the heart of summation identity. And one of the things that we could probably do very subtly is answer that question, but not quite in the way that we'd hoped, I think. I think that's what a project that looks at the interior of the fort can really do. We can really see those very subtle pulsing transformations generation by generation by generation. Well, that's a lot of questions to answer and presumably more came up along the way. So how did it go? So one of the things we're able to do in the early years is to look at those very late sequences to try and look at that continuity aspect of it. So as Jim said, what we thought before was that the fort was abandoned quite early in declining influence of the imperial administration on Britain in about the third century AD. But very quickly, we identified Huntcliffe and Cranbeck Ware in our very late sequences. And these were on top of stratigraphy that included third century coins. So that's, you know, it's a pot find. We are archaeology nerds, aren't we? But that's awesome. It's awesome because, first off, it tells us that our connections are east-west. So in the late period, we are more interested in what's going on the other side of the Pennines in Yorkshire in terms of economic trade movement across the road systems than we are in what's going on in Chester and what's going on down in London, and therefore the rest of the imperial system. So Ribchester starting to look like it's a little bit on its own, a little bit part of its own network of northern Britain, a little bit separated just on the basis of half a dozen bits of pot, which is cool. Second bit is that we don't really have that many 
bits of Huntcliffe and Cranbrook were this side of the Pennines. Okay, so this suddenly became the biggest spike in that particular type of pottery we've got. So that's really cool. So we're going, right, okay. Now the Northwest is starting to look like part of a network. This is brilliant. Okay, really cool stuff. But also, okay, all those little tiny coins underneath them, all of those are very heavily worn. All of those are fake. They're all made in Ribchester or its immediate environments, which is not necessarily unusual in a lake fort, but they're sitting underneath all of that. Our evidence indicates that buildings have been destroyed, removed, turned into open areas, and our coins are distributed across that surface, this open surface, just inside the entrance of the Northern Gate. So we have probably a series of markets. And that links really nicely to that sort of pottery exchange network activities and ideas that are taking place. Suddenly, in that idea that we all have of a Roman fort being a built-up military camp, we've got a completely different thing going on. We've got open spaces, possibly with markets, linking to its broader hinterland that's widening out into that northern British well, I'm going to call it a hemisphere, but that's probably the wrong word, isn't it? But you know what I mean? It's you know the whole world view of those people living in that fort and immediately around that fort is focused on Hadrian's Wall, on the east-west connection, on the sort of surviving Roman fortifications. And what's brilliant about that really is it starts to push our date way beyond that initial assumption, right probably into the fourth century, and I hope beyond. In our first season, we excavated a load of soil that we called dark earth. Now, whether it really is gardening soil is open to debate, really. But it contained a whole series of small medieval artefacts. Ripchester, as Jim has already said, still exists. There is a village right on top of it, actually just next to the enclosure that was the fort itself. And in the middle of the fort, adjacent to our trench, is a medieval church. Bang. It survives because it wasn't built on by medieval villagers. It was built on by the church and enclosed. And so we have a very small amount of medieval activity on top of it, which basically means that the whole fort survives really nicely. So we do see a picture of abandonment, but it's one which seems to transform by about the 8th century, the church is called St. Wifrance. So it's an Anglo-Saxon church in its origin, and a very important one on the crossing of the River Ribble. So it have that transformation from an important military site, trading network, a central place in the northwest of Britain, uniting the north in that late period, to then becoming an important ecclesiastical centre. It's a really good continuity that's starting to push the edges of how we see the survival of Roman Britain. You know, you almost see that transformation into an ecclesiastical place as a sort of reference to the importance of Rome and its importance in the establishment and understanding of the early church, that connection to the Latin East being most significant there. So that's the later stuff, the late antique and the early medieval. What was the transition from? What we're able to do, because we're investigating inside the fort, is look at that transformation of building biographies all the way through. So we've got underneath our markets, we've got metalworking shops. These are probably about that third century abandonment phase. And really the first opportunity we had to look at proper building structures. In this case, these are probably wooden timber buildings as opposed to stone buildings because it's wooden buildings that really make up the majority of Roman buildings in Britain. But inside these, we've got kilns for making metal, something you see for in that region, for example, in the edges of the Manchester fort. You see the metal workshops outside, and you see those metal workshops opening up in the later period and becoming probably part of that marketization that starts to take place. But that's outside the fort. In Ribchester, it's inside the fort. So have we got manufacturing activities? Have we got the sort of things you normally associate with the vicus? taking place inside the fort. Probably that tells us that Ribchester and Lancashire is quite dangerous if you need to bring in your critical activities inside the walls. But it might also tell us who's doing it. Is it Roman soldiers or their immediate associates rather than civilians who are outside the fort? Unfortunately, we don't know because we haven't yet had the opportunity to excavate all of that sort of vicus surrounding areas. But it looks like from previous excavation reports and small scale interventions that have identified bits of the vicus, that is abandoned quite early. So it does sort of fit with that picture of all of that civilian activities, all those things that are not necessarily directly associated with military into the fort as it becomes something else. And what's the Sarmatian cavalry there? Still we're talking about the third century here. Into the second century, we have open buildings. It's much less 
obvious what they are, but they've always been identified because of the location as barracks. We couldn't find very much in the way of evidence for horses within the barracks, which is what you'd expect in an auxiliary cavalry fort. But really, we only caught the very edge of the building. So it's slightly difficult to identify that. And I think to look at horses, you'd have to be looking at phosphorus in trenches inside the centre of buildings. So we weren't quite in the right place to look at that. If they weren't barracks, they're these sort of big open buildings that are left blank in terms of our understanding. So we don't really know. But what we did have in terms of artefacts was a whole series of fixings and fittings. So it looks like little bits associated with chairs and furniture and that sort of stuff. Maybe on this important location, we saw the very end of a barrack building, the sort of centurion's room, or maybe it was a storeroom not sure yet and I think it's going to be really in the post excavation where we're going to start to understand that where we can piece together the artifactual evidence and the environmental evidence to try and see how that building was being used and I know that when they did that at Silchester which is a town in the south of Britain they discovered that buildings that they thought were quite high status were being used to store animals so that kind of process can be really quite enlightening. Underneath all of that we had a whole series of wells associated with the second century phase. So at this point, we're starting to see how the fort was moving in its space. And that links up very closely with our defensive structures. And I think it's very clear that we're not looking at a single fort, but looking at multiple forts that are expanded and changed shape over time. So when we excavated the northern gatehouse, we could see that it's a stone square gatehouse with a bank of earth next to it. It looks like the gatehouse had been cut into the bank of earth. So a late phase, which we associated with sort of tarting up of the fort in about the third century AD, possibly slightly earlier than that. And the building of a stone curtain wall around the earth bank very significant phase in the sort of presentation of the fort and possibly associated with an important visitor or a change in commander and a move towards stone working that isn't really seen except the very very early phases which include the Principia and the finds in the museum from the 1920s really big dramatic pieces of stonework so it's interesting that the phases that we're looking at third and fourth centuries are primarily built in rubble and in wood and soil very, very different to that sort of high imperial second century idea of what a Roman fort is. So important that we've got that tarting up. Maybe we've got a new officer coming from France or Gaul to take over the command and bringing with him an idea about a Roman fort that isn't seen in third century Ribchester. Okay, and why is that significant? I think that's quite key because one of our research questions was to try and understand Sarmatian identity. If, and this is a very good question, if Sarmatians are forming a significant part or the entire part of the auxiliary cavalry unit that are settling and establishing their fort in the second or third phase of fort construction, it's interesting that they can't use stone. That almost confirms it, if you like. These guys are a nomadic horse tribe, for want of a better word, who are not familiar with, with imperial stone making. And so the, the fact that the fort reflects the sorts of technologies that they have access to, the sorts of ways and ideas that they have, is really, I think, a, a very subtle confirmation of that point. It's not a banner head. Uh, you know, it's not a, a great big Sarmatian brooch or a long sword or something of that ilk, but it still, it sort of points to the subtlety of the way that we live our lives, the way that we think and construct the spaces around us. And I think it's just as important as those things to understand that a space uh, shifts and change and is altered as effectively that unit moves from being 100% Sarmatian to Sarmatian with a bit of offspring of the Sarmatians who are locals really. Suddenly they've got Gaulic or Imperial commanders coming in and the whole identity of the fort, the feel of it is transforming over the second, third, fourth century until it's eventually abandoned by people just moving gently into the landscape around it rather than this big dramatic transformation. This is an ongoing project, but what would you say are the major achievements so far? One of the things we have been able to do, which I hope Jim will be able to speak about a little bit, probably what is the most comprehensive environmental survey that has ever taken place in a Roman British site, looking at every single context, you know, washing the soil and extracting the different artefacts and uh, and faunal remains from there. And I think that is 
an absolutely transformative thing, both in terms of our understanding of the different types of features and how they form in tiers of buildings versus pits and ditches and things like that, but also in terms of just understanding the methodologies that are used. So we can speak about Roman identity a bit. We can see the transforming interior of the fort, which is a really crucial part of our questioning here. And I think that is the piece we did most successfully, is really start to look at the detail of the changing structure of the defences and the evolving interior, and really question that sort of playing card stereotype we have of a Roman fort, and think about how it's a dynamic and transforming place. And that's absolutely critical, I think, to understanding forts and their place in the landscape. So I think we, we've done that very well, and I hope that we can continue to do that as the environmental evidence comes online and becomes much more important. Jim, when I was at Ribchester, I witnessed Don O'Meara running this extraordinary environmental undertaking. What were the processes involved there? So one of the aspects that really developed as the project was ongoing was the environmental evidence. There were a number of previous excavations. It's only really the English heritage excavations from 1989 that undertook a detailed environmental archaeology work on the remains there. So this really gave us a great opportunity to undertake really detailed environmental archaeology on the later stone fort, on those later Roman contexts. So we developed a rather significant environmental sampling strategy. And of course, that's what we should do because... We're a research excavation. We have some time. The soil nature of Ribchester, it is a number of heavy clays, which make it a bit of a challenge for excavation. But in terms of environmental remains, made it actually even more of a challenge. So one of the things we've done is start to test out some new methodologies. And one of the things we're doing with environmental remains is we are reflotting. So when you undertake a, an environmental sample, you take 40 litres of the context for wet sieving. Do you get two remains from that? Your residue, the heavy residue that will go to the bottom of the mesh in the sieve. And then you get your flot, which has the archaeobotanical remains and anything else that will float or go into the flot. Once that heavy residue has been sorted and artifacts have been picked out of it, and actually it's where the majority of our glass beads come from, is then we've reflotted it again and we've discovered we get almost twice the amount of archaeobotanical material out of the second flot than we do the first flot. What that's giving us then is a fantastic archaeobotanical data set to go along with the zooarchaeological and other environmental remains and mollusks as well that are coming out of the wet sieve material. That is interesting to environmental archaeologists like myself, but it, it's interesting to all archaeologists because actually one of the things we need to think about in terms of the interior of these forts is what's the environment like? What are people living in? Duncan mentioned about how post-excavation at Silchester changed interpretations of rooms from people thinking it had been quite high status to find out that animals have been stored there. The environmental remains we're getting from Ribchester will give us a really nice detailed picture of actually what the environment is like in that fort. And that's really important because if you discuss Roman forts with people, they have this image of these pristine stone buildings, legionaries marching around and everything is very neat and ordered. But in reality, with that later stone fort, wooden buildings, messy roads that are repaired with rubble, and where the coins were lost, it seems the coins were lost in these rubble roadways as well. So probably there's a layer of detritus is probably the best word for it. So animal feces. This is not the kind of pristine, shiny legionary structure that people think of. In reality, the later Roman fort is probably quite a mucky, smelly, busy, noisy place. So where does the project go from here? And how do you get from excavation to publication? So we're just, you know, scratching the surface at the moment. It was five years of excavation, and we're probably looking at five years of post-excavation. So working our way through the pottery remains and the environmental remains and the animal bone and all the other artefacts that we've uncovered. And what will happen is, as specialists examine the material, new questions will come up. And big archaeological projects are like this. They are fluid beasts in that you start off with 
these are our questions that we're interested in, for example, what's going on in Ribchester in the late Roman. But as you start to answer that question, you always get new and more interesting questions and little sidetrack projects will develop. And that's actually the bit I'm really looking forward to seeing what other little projects will spring from Ribchester. Publication, I think, will happen piecemeal in that the key things like the environmental evidence were published in academic journal papers. But then we'll be looking at producing a large monograph itself. Exactly what format that will take depends a little bit on the research landscape at the time, a little bit on on funding, and a little bit on what the results look like. But it will be a, a substantial and hopefully very significant piece of work. Well, hopefully we can talk about those publications as they come out. So thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Jim. And also thank you to Hannah Friedman. There are links to these research projects on the website. Thank you.